Good evening, welcome to the Parish Art Museum. My name is Corinne Ernie. I'm the Senior Curator of Arts Reach and Special Projects here at the Parish. And it's my distinct pleasure to um, introduce you to a wonderful talk tonight with our Chief Curator, Alicia Longwell, um, who curated the exhibition with the artists that she's talking with tonight. Um, we have uh, two of the, art the three artists who currently have solo exhibitions here. And I have to apologize, but Virginia Jaramillo had to cancel her presence tonight. Um, before I introduce the artists, I would like to thank our sponsors who make the Friday nights uh, possible. That's our presenting sponsor, Bank of America, um, the Corcoran Group, and Sandy and Stephen Pearlbinder. So thank you so much. And um, thank you so much for coming out tonight. I mean, I know it's really cold out there. And I know we have a pretty big presence online. Uh, so hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. So I'd like to introduce the two artists who are here with us tonight. Um, Peter Campus is a seminal artist in the canons of new media and video art. In a solitary pursuit over the past year, Peter positioned his camera around the shores of Shinnecock Bay, not far from his home in Patchogue. The resulting six works, all to be shown in the exhibition, and the exhibition is in the first half of um, the galleries, uh, they invite the viewer to meditate on the sublime beauty of the natural landscape while noting the gap between what we perceive, what the camera records, and what the artist brings to the fore in the video. About, and John Torriano, um, with the universe as his muse, New York and Sac Harbor-based artist John Torriano combines realism infused with abstraction to create works that conflate time and space, often mapping out ideas on paper first and expanding in paintings, Toriano has been inspired by the myriad images recorded by the Hubble Space Telescope to create works that contrast the physical with the illusory. So welcome, Alicia, Peter, and um, John. And um, let's get started. Thank you very much. I know. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am uh, conveying uh, Virginia's deep regret. She can't be with us this evening. It's something came up very suddenly. She is okay. Her family's okay, but she just could not be here. So we'll try to have a rematch here at some point. Um, nonetheless, it's an extreme, extreme <laughs> pleasure to rematch. have my two. <laughs> well, whatever. Yeah. Um, to have two uh, artists whom um, I'm fortunate enough to have known their, them and their work for quite a while. We don't have to count years here, do we? Get too many, yes. <laughs> no. Um, and uh, it, it was just a thrill that uh, sort of a confluence of many things that uh, John had an exhibition that had um, been in um, Boulder at yes. the Museum of Contemporary Art there, wonderful, which we were able to um, glom onto, so capture. to speak. <laughs> capture, bring it here, not in its full entity, but a wonderful moment to look at the work that you have done in this area. Peter, we had always thought of, well, bringing your work here, and it finally came to fruition. I don't want to, lots of cups of tea, as I remember over the years. Many lunches. <laughs> <laughs> And, but I think of both of them in this iteration, uh, this unique showing here at the parish, both are absolutely perfect presentations of the work. And that's what's so exciting for me and I think for everyone who has seen the work as well. I, I'm always interested when artists mention other artists and their um, work and in talking about their work and I think both John and, and Peter have mentioned, and it's in the text, uh, the wall text, or even in the naming of the paintings. You talk about Suzanne. Well, uh, usually when people ask who has influenced me, I'll go to, uh, well, Caravaggio, <laughs> or Cezanne, and then they say, no, living. Oh, <laughs> no. And then I get to be a smart ass and say, well, for an artist, uh, uh, all art is contemporary art. You can be influenced by an Egyptian painting as much as you can someone uh, that lives in the same neighborhood. And uh, that's part of what it's about for us, that uh, making work is what keeps us, uh, you know, 
Uh, it keeps the idea of mortality at bay. <laughs> exactly. But anyway, I, uh, I then usually say uh, my friend Richard Archwager had a big influence on me uh, when I met him back in, we met in South Dakota, actually, when I was teaching there. He came through as a visiting artist, and I immediately uh, connected to his painting that uh, he showed in slides and a sculpture because... <clears throat> It was everything at once. It was a painting, it was a sculpture, and it was a drawing. And so those are a few of the people. A re uh, I still haven't gotten uh, as far as the perceptual intensity and complexity is concerned. I still haven't gotten past Cezanne. So I know it sounds like... Uh, <laughs> you can always come back to all roads uh, lead to... Yeah, to your... a certain extent. Yeah. Now... Peter, in the wall text, you wanted to include a quote from the Abbot Suger. Suger, yes. Yes. Can we place him in time and space for those of us? That... <coughs> he, I had to Google again. No. He was the abbot in charge of building of Saint Denis, the mm -hmm. first Gothic church. Right. And I worked for the Metropolitan Museum in 1969. It was part of the year 1200 show, and so I, with the people I work for, went over to the Chartres Cathedral. We spent a month there. Mm. Um, so it, it, it was a real experience for me in many ways. I mean, being in that cathedral for a month was extraordinary. It, I felt it took me weeks to, to kind of get it, but then I got it. And the quote from Sujay is what it is. Um, I have it here. Okay. You yeah, let's hear it. You want me to read it? Sure. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, the noble work is bright, but being nobly bright, the work should brighten the minds, allowing them to travel through the lights. Mm. That's, That's pretty good. And yeah. rhymes. Yeah, so this... <laughs> Well, it was probably written, written in French. It was written in Latin. <laughs> oh, Latin, <laughs> yes. So your influences are even further back than mine. <laughs> no, I just love art yeah. and, and movies and photography, and it's all interesting to me. So you were working in film then? I worked in film yeah. uh, up till then, and then I switched to video and did some work <clears> for the Metropolitan in video, which was amazing. It was the first time that um, anyone had put a, a TV monitor in, inside a gallery. And the work that I remember was on Chinese bronzes, um, uh, Song Dynasty bronzes. I liked it. I don't know if the curators in the oh, museum well. liked it, but probably not. Because everyone stood in front of the television. No. Or the monitor, I don't no. think so. Those, <laughs> The bronzes were really compelling. They, they oh. held up very nicely. <laughs> would this, would this be a piece that you would include in an exhibition of your work? Or no. was this just for them? It's gone. Oh. You know, including the film that we made for the, uh, for the Metropolitan Museum. Some people on the staff, it was made for Francis Thompson. And uh, I had a conversation with someone from that company looking for that. Uh, film, but it's gone. Hmm. I hate that. Well, when that happens. that's why we hold on to our work. <laughs> so after that, you went exclusively into then video. I, then I just worked in video, but I'm in, so in, interested in film. and It's um, what I, and photography, hmm. and, oh, and trying to help video become an art medium. Still not quite there, I think, but it's just been 50 years. It took photography probably 100 years to be accepted by the community. Well, I think it's accepted, but it's taking a long view. As art. And yeah. Now, I happen to, I was Googling because something you don't know from the introduction or read all the fine print about John is that you have appeared as a stand-up comedian from time to time. I did do that for a while. Back I in wanted the to early find a clip 80s. to show. But. 
Uh, do you know who uh, Lou Black is, by any chance? Back yeah. with Black. Uh, he was a friend of a friend of mine that I met at dinner once uh, back in 1981. And he was running a little room called, um, uh, <clears throat> what's the name of the sculpt sculpture on uh, the Picasso sculpture in, on oh, LaGuardia. So, so that's the so faux, so so excuse that. me, the faux Picasso sculpture. Oh, it's faux, right. Yes. It's not it by is. Picasso. <laughs> Picasso made a little drawing and that's... And they did it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, anyway, this little room was right there on LaGuardia called Silvettes and it run by a little Greek guy. And in the back, he had little food and bar, and, but in the back he had this room and Lou was, he said, you know, I'm running this room I have people come in, uh, do comedy, do play the guitar, whatever. You should try it. Because I, I said, you know, I get opportunities to perform comedy, and I've always thought, no, because the first thing, the first time I do comedy, if it's any good, people will come up to me and say, John, we love the comedy. <laughs> because I was very self-conscious about the criticism I was taking for my painting. So I said, no, I, I, I didn't want to give them that opportunity. But, but then I thought, not everybody's turning down opportunities to do comedy. So maybe it's something coming that I'm projecting. I got to do it. As an artist, I have to follow through. So <clears throat> I practiced for two weeks in my studio holding a stick, you know, as a mic. And I remember calling up Lou halfway through and saying, Lou, I don't know what's going on, but every time I try my material, it comes out like Henny Youngman. <laughs> He says, everybody goes through Henny Youngman. <laughs> and uh, because Henny Youngman and uh, Rodney Dangerfield and people like that are kind of like nervousness in action, you know. And I said, I'm more like, uh, you know, the rope twirling uh, guy where, where I just spin yarns and stuff. But anyway, so I did that and uh, I, I got a huge crowd from the art world because nobody had ever experienced a, what someone's considered a serious painter doing stand-up comedy. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I've never run across one. In you know, panels. and then <laughs> and I got one of my best reviews in the Soho uh, News, and, uh, and so as a result of doing that, I was asked periodically for forever to be an MC and do comedy for fundraisers. Things I, like that. So that's the story of that. I did catch yeah. online the Ant Wizard. Ant lizard, the, where you make the diamond with the it's like oh, watch oh, Mr. Yes. Wizard, but you. That was a uh, Carol Clanarides, uh, who uh, was a video uh, person at the time. She's a, a, a really good uh, art personality and character in terms of uh, curatorialship and so on. But uh, her and a friend uh, were doing videos of artists. <clears throat> where they would kind of write up a theme for each artist, like they did one of Cindy Sherman, wherein Cindy is sitting there, and it's in the earlier days of her work, when it was a largely black and white uh, images from films, and she was sitting at a table interviewing for a job, and every minute a different uh, persona would emerge from her. You know? So what they did for me was they uh, did an imitation of the uh, art were the the uh, Mr. Wizard uh, TV show from the fifties, which was a pseudo. Was a, it was a, it wasn't pseudo. It was science for kids, and they would have a kid come in or a couple kids. And Jimmy, you know what we're going to do today? And he would say, "I'm going to be able to lift you up with my finger." You know, wouldn't get away with that now. But uh, <laughs> and they then the whole show would be about levers and stuff. So. They thought it would be fun to do a, a video of me called John Toriano Art World Wizard. And it consisted of uh, a, a boy, his name was uh, Light Bujani, and he was a twin, and the son of an artist named Paolo Bujani, who was a uh, performance artist, and he did things with fire and, and, mm -hmm. and so on. Do you think we could talk about art a little here? Yes. No, no. I'm done. <laughs> that, that would just be entertaining. <laughs> well, I was going to get to the art part. Oh, okay. They made a, they made a dump. Well, what? Yeah, yeah. You can Google it. Yeah. It's priceless. Yeah. Now. 
I know. No. I, I, I get nervous and I talk too much. Well, that's all right. Yeah. John Obviously. and I taught together for yeah, so 30 years. I was going to say, yes. <laughs> 30 years, I think. These two are very old. No, not very old. Colleagues. Yes. Colleagues of long standing. These two are very old. No, no. Yes. But um, what, what? so you knew each other teaching. Oh, yeah. At, yes. We taught NYU. courses together a few yeah. times. <clears throat> Did students change over the years? No. <laughs> I don't think they changed from third grade to graduate school, frankly. <laughs> okay. not, not much. Yeah. I don't even know why what we were doing there other than picking up a check. <laughs> well, I've... I guess the, the really good students didn't need us, right? I mean, I don't uh, think so. Occasionally, but it was the mediocre students that we relied on. <laughs> <laughs> To teach. To teach. Oh, okay. To, okay. Um, I don't know where to go after that. How would you comment on it? I, I don't feel the same way, I don't think. Uh, you know, I had a lot of positive and uh, helpful experiences with many generations. One of the things I liked about teaching was the fact that I was introduced to so many different generations of people that became artists. Carol Vove was one of my students. Yeah, you example. had some good students. You know, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, Matthew, uh, no, I'm blanking on his name, but uh, oh, sorry. he was here yeah. last time we were here, but uh, <coughs> in one of these talks, mm -hmm. a whole host of them. And then also over in Abu Dhabi, I had the opportunity to teach students from every culture you can imagine and the, the different cultures and how the students interact with the professors was really interesting. So when did NYU open that? Oh, <laughs> well, about 2010. Yeah, big money making thing for them. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just like to tell the truth. <laughs> That's it was. right. And I mean, everything was a lot of money. He promised he would. So everything was yeah. money making for NYU. Well, yes. They had terrific uh, real estate holdings in Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. So you retired from teaching. Oh, yes, I did. That's true. At age 74, I think, or older. You too? You were 2018, so I don't yeah, know. I was 2014. Well, it's, it's about the same. Yeah. <clears throat> Are you glad you retired? Yes, it's been a great period for me to have all this yeah. time to work. I, I've loved it, but the pandemic has really been hard. But... Oh. I mean, I, I think it's the way we should, things should be, that we have all this time to work. And um, it's what it takes. When I was teaching, I could work three, four months a year, and that was it. I mean, I could do a little bit during the school year, but not much. But now it's wonderful. Um, the, body of, the body of work on view here is from, I would say, Fairly near your home? No. In East Patrick? It's not well, near my home. <laughs> and it's not six pictures and what else no. did, was said wrong. But um, it's, it was I much... I said body of work. I it's, know it's closer to here than my home. Um, it takes me about a half hour to get there from my house. Okay. And it takes about 10 minutes from here to get to Shinnecock Bay. But there's just something... There, I mean, first of all, there's the Pine Barrens. As we were driving here, you know, and it was the sun was just beginning to set. And mm -hmm. Entering the Pine Barrens, and the light is just spectacular, and the winter sky was amazing. I mean, there's something about this area that's beyond description. I mean, it, I'd, I haven't been in many places that is... Um, I don't know, so meaningful to me is uh, Shinnecock Bay. Hmm. And I, I think the other thing I feel really strongly is the place is important to me, maybe more than the individual piece. So this, I'm steering to another subject, excuse me, but this, this edifice, this beautiful building reminds me of Schottler. It is just so extraordinary. And the light coming from above. I mean, this, the skylights. I, there are very few places that I, 
I've been doing this for 50 years. There are very few places that compete with this museum in terms of beauty of the, and, and the uh, proportions of the galleries. And, um, and how so, it serves the art. Yes, not the Guggenheim, which, and you're out. Um, That's so cynical, the Guggenheim, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's... Go up in the elevator, hurry up. <laughs> there have been some really good movie scenes done in the Guggenheim. I bet. Yes. Uh, and what I tried to do in my installation was to do something architectural. So it wasn't just the individual images, but I tried to create the space um, architecturally and maybe make some reference to the dimensions of the building mm -hmm. and the geometry. I, uh, geometry has always been a part of my work, but to create a installation that has um, references to geometric references, just the way it's placed <clears throat> sculpturally. So it's, I'm really happy with the result here, and I don't often say that. There, I can't think of, I mean, there are, I could start naming a few, uh, a few um, installations that I really liked, but this mm -hmm. is re really right there at the top. That means a great deal to all this, of us I, here that love this building. I feel the same it. way about I think the same thing for John. Yeah. I mean, it's like a cathedral space, you know, a choir, and you you need that space for those works. And for me, uh, it was the first opportunity in the New York area. The, the very first one uh, was in Boulder, but uh, <clears throat> for New York, it's the first opportunity I've had to show mm -hmm. these paintings of this scale. I've never had the um, uh, the gallery, the kind of gallery that would have the ability or desire to want to show big works like that. And mm -hmm. uh, I think of myself as a painter first and foremost, even though I do a lot of three-dimensional things, I still think of them as paintings. <laughs> and here I had that opportunity and the scale of that room and these yeah. paintings, it was just perfect for me. The height is perfect of the studio, of the um, galleries too. Yeah. I really don't run into that very often. The, the great, and I hope you get to show there, but the great place for me was San Ildefonso in, in Mexico City. Oh. Yeah. It, was, it, it was the kind of the same feeling I had as here. That's a... Hmm? That's San Ildefonso? Yeah. As you go up, uh, my exhibit was, I think, on the third floor, and then you pass Diego Rivera, <laughs> you know, murals. And yeah. okay. <laughs> I mean, it was really... It's where um, Diego and uh, Frida Kahlo met. She was a student, and he was teaching there. It, but not that. It just was this beautiful, beautiful space that had um, concrete floors, but they were dyed red. And so there was this red, beautiful red flooring throughout that space. What kind of building was it? Was it a... San Diego, um Kathleen, do you know? Municipal was though. it Adobe? Oh. The school. Yeah. The school was next yeah. to it. Yeah. That was real. And then we'd just pop Short. out, you know, at lunchtime and have the best Mexican food you can imagine. <laughs> On the <a> street, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, yeah, it was a restaurant, the... but it was outdoor restaurant yeah. with them. It's just gorgeous. Yeah. I don't think I've ever heard quite such a uh, beautiful. That's Supportive. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very well, much. That's true. Well, you know? it's true. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, well, I wouldn't we, say it. The architects consulted with the artists. They certainly visited a, a lot of artist studios, which really inspired the peak of the the roof of the barn studios that had been converted and many people used. Really inspired them in that sense. So. And architecturally, it so fits into this area, mm -hmm. you know, and that you see buildings that relate to it, yeah. and it's really yeah. quite an achievement. Yeah. Although when you're outside on the outer walk with the eaves, it's it's like a cloister. It's almost like a medieval cloister on the side. It's very beautiful. Well, uh, every day, <laughs> right, guys? <laughs> it's great to be here. It really is. It is. It's so thrilling to hear what both of you have to say.
You mentioned photography. You mentioned photography. You, yeah. You, when you first I, I, moved I mentioned to photography. East, when you first moved Peter. to East. <laughs> you're funny, too. Yes. I, 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 you're starting subtle. to get entertaining, subtle, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> Stu yeah. Chant said that artists are clowns. Uh, and I, I know what he means. I mean, it, you don't have to be doing this very long till you get what that means. Attention. You want to. Well, but it it also you, means, uh, it's similar to the idea of the, jest, the court jester, too, in the sense that the court jester was the one person that could communicate the, what's going on with the underclass to the king. And so he had to be on that edge. If he was too realistic, they'd off with his head. And if he wasn't on the edge enough, he wouldn't get the job. Huh. Well, and Nauman had that wonderful piece. How, oh. What was it, 10 the years cloud. ago? No, yeah. no, no. I, I mean, that, that was an extraordinary piece. <clears throat> Nauman's a great artist. You want to know who influences me? It was, yeah. it was first Nauman, when I was just starting out, he had his card art pieces. And he was using video the way I thought it should be used. Mm -hmm. which is a displacement between camera and, and monitor. And I still think in terms of displacement of image, what I'm doing here is all about displacement of image, obviously. I mean, those scenes are not there, they're here. Mm -hmm. And I, I like walking away from the camera when I'm shooting because it's, the whole thing about um, cameras is so when you put it up to your eye, you're diminishing the amount of vision you have. But when you put it next to it, like you could with video, then you're increasing the amount of visual mm -hmm. image you have. And also spatially, you have a re relationship to it. So I was kind of anti uh, movies in the sense that you'd go into a theater, you'd sit in a very comfortable chair, and you'd lose yourself watching the film. And you're supposed to lose yourself. You're supposed to be transported into that scene and, and that you become Cary Grant or whatever. I mean, or John Wayne. Not so much John Wayne for me, but. Um, and uh, what I think video is doing is something different. I think it's more akin to art where it's, it's a relationship between painting and you standing there in front of the painting. And for me with video, there's a relationship between the the monitors and you standing there in front of the monitors and and always being conscious of you're in this room and you're you're yourself mm -hmm. and and the relationship between you and the art and um, I think that's what at least I tried to teach my students was just stand there you you know stand. If you're looking at a painting, stand there for a while and and do more than look. If you're going out on a, a shoot, a video shoot, forget about the camera, just stand there for a while and try and understand where you are. Um, tough lesson to teach. It's happened to me often enough. Yeah. You know the, sun, the Sunday morning magazine show, uh, CBS, yeah. Yeah. at the end of the show, they do usually a, a scene that, uh, of nature somewhere. Yeah. And to me, those scenes are different than a film would be because they're video. They're, they're, mm -hmm. Somehow you are more in the present of the space that they're showing. But it's still garbage. <laughs> no, it, it, it is garbage. But I'm supporting what you were saying about okay. the difference between film no, but and you're video. Not, you're not really supporting it because the yes. way they're using the imagery is just garbage. I mean, it's just oh, here, let's take a minute off and tell you how wonderful it is to be in nature. And you're not in nature. You're in front of your fucking TV set. Mm -hmm. I still like it. Okay. Oh. <laughs> well, I still disagree. For with regular it. TV. All right. <laughs> yeah. uh, you, you call the current work videograph. Right. <clears throat> Videography. How does that? Well, I spent 17 years doing photographs, and I, I did that because I started slowing everything down to the point where there was no movement whatsoever. And I said, well, no movement whatsoever. I might as well make a photograph. Well, that was totally untrue because <laughs> in video, when there's no movement of the camera, there's the expectation that something's going to move, and so there's a kind of tension there. Whereas in photography, it's 
So I never truly understood photography, I think, for 17 years I spent not understanding photography. <laughs> That's a long time. That is, but I'm slow. It takes me 17 years. <laughs> so this work was a combination, I think, of what I had climb into mountains with a large camera, 4x5 or 5x7 camera, and take pictures. And it was a lot about setting up and being there and understanding where you were and um, first being before you looked, before you set up the camera. And so... I got to some point where when I went back to video, I thought, okay, bring these two things together. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. what happened. So um, that's why I call them videographs. They're photographs and video, both. Yeah. And They're beautiful. Thank you. And no movement yeah. of the camera seems essential because, mm -hmm. um, so I think of them almost like, um, you know, in geology, there are cores. You put a gore into the ground and come up with a kind of history, uh, geological history. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think of it that way. Interesting. I, um, I saw some photographs that you had made, although you're not primarily known for that, of your hometown. Yes, I've always had a <clears throat> relationship with photography, but mm -hmm. I never... I always uh, loved cameras and loved taking pictures and doing prints and so on, but I never thought of it as part of my artwork until I got support from uh, Jerry Pryor <laughs> saying, you should show these. And I, I went to, on an, in 2007, I think it was, I went to my hometown, Flint, Michigan. It happened to be a cold day like this on Easter. And I had two of my old high school friends. One of them had been... <clears throat> the head of the AFL of IO, and he knew all the factories. My other friend, in fact, I posted it on uh, on uh, Facebook, an image of his house called Jack's House, which the place I spent all my weekends at, away from my family, which was crowded with kids. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so we went. To, uh, I wanted to do the factories. That was my original motivation because. <clears throat> They were going to be all torn down eventually. And I don't know, I, I, I believe anything, anytime something becomes obsolete, it, become, it has the potential of being art. And in a way, when you look at these factory buildings, their only job was producing, right? Mm -hmm. And so the essentialism of that architecture is really quite beautiful. You don't really appreciate it when it's actually functioning like right. a tool. So that's why I went there. But as I was going to the different factories and taking pictures, I realized the factories and uh, my, where my house was, where we lived and where my friends lived, they were right near the factories. So uh, they were pre-war factories. Mm -hmm. Post-war, the factories were like ugly and were supposed to be outside of the suburb. <laughs> and so that uh, became the aegis for the title, which is Factories and Neighborhood. They were brick? Yeah, brick and steel, you know, and long, like the line. And uh, the lights, the the, the uh, windows were there for light, you know, yeah. to light the line. So then I started, I had a show of those, and I started to think, well, maybe I should take it more seriously. When I was in Abu Dhabi, <clears throat> I got very immediately obsessed with the uh, colors and the materials of the buildings that were used there, because they do things that we would never do uh, because of expense and so on. So you would have a building that had green glass and pink uh, outsides and red trim right next to one where a guy put blue glass and then a, a hospital with gold, you know. And I started taking, I had to take pictures because they already look like paintings. <laughs> and uh, so I ended up having a few shows of, of those. I upped my, each time I would go back, to Abu Dhabi, I would up my technical game and get a better camera, a better lens, learn more from my friends who were photographers. Interesting. Yeah, I've never, I don't think I've shown those here uh, anywhere. But. <clears throat> no. But then uh, the Hubble telescope in 18, 18 That's 1989. That's a photo. Yeah. 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 That's but I was uh, responding to photographs of uh, outer space mm -hmm. and um, uh, stars originally because I wanted to make 
my dot distributions uh, in these abstract paintings more particular. Because mm -hmm. if you do them just out of your head, you do one, two, 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 you know, they become cliches. So I thought, gee, where are there dots in nature? <laughs> Stars. So I started looking in the books and I started responding and sure enough, I had better resources and better combinations. And then I started reading about them and then uh, I started realizing that the concepts of outer space, uh, curvature and so on, aligned a lot more with my idea about painting space than contemporary art theory space did. Mm. So uh, I was, was anti-Greenberg without really knowing it. <laughs> yeah. we, <clears throat> we were running into the same problem with postmodernism, I felt. I don't know that we ever talked about it. We but should. We should. Yeah. I mean, there were qualities about postmodern, and also in our school, there were things that you could never really talk about when we met together as a group, because they were just, oh my God, you're not really saying that, are you? Like, give an example. To well, to yeah. talk about beauty, for yeah. example, or spiritual qualities, and um, and it was just such a no-no. We, I think we just never did, right? I, I don't think I ever did. Uh, I would talk about uh, formalist uh, issues that would be assumed back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and it just was like a wet blanket. Yeah. You know, it, all of the discourse today seems to be about express self-expression or something. And identity. not huh? identity, self-expression. As if the uh, idea is uh, isn't public almost. Well, mm -hmm. I'm interested in, in Spinoza right now, so that is totally contrary to that. Um, what what drawn you into? Spinoza. I think just um, he's a Jew, I'm a Jew. He uh, went from, he's a Sephardic Jew, I'm a Sephardic Jew. He traveled to Netherlands. My ancestors went through the Netherlands and then went up to Romania. Mm -hmm. So I feel somewhat akin, but I feel akin philosophically. I mean, he, I'm just really interested in what he said. And it, it's it's a theology without um, God being separated from anything. I mean, we're it's all part of the same thing, and that is of interest to me. Um, and then talking about uh, Spinoza, he talks about two two dimensions that we can perceive out of multiple n-dimensional space, which is things that we can't perceive, uh, and all that. I, you know, I studied mathematics and all that seems really, I mean, this is hundreds and hundreds of years ago and it seems really of great interest to me. Do you identify in any way with the transcendentalism and pantheism and so on? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Not so much, no. I, I mean, Spinoza was beyond pantheism. I mean, some Sometimes people call him a pantheist, but he wasn't. That is too specific. Uh, I, I just, um, I, I think with our art, my art, John's art, we're going beyond um, words, I think. Yeah. That's part of art, I suppose. I mean, we speak a universal language, and uh, but the interest now is, is beyond postmodernism. For me and I think for you. Me too. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, especially today, anti um, the ideals of modernism in the sense that it was very utopian and universal mm -hmm. language oriented. And also the idea that art making was equivalent to science in terms of uh, investigating possibilities. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the discussion today isn't about that. In, in fact, they might get mad at you. <laughs> well, there was a You're limiting right. quality yeah. of that to <clears throat> what art, the, what I believe art is. And I don't know, but the, the whole time I was at school that we both taught, I felt that limitation. Oh, no, you're not going to say that, are you? Um, wow. I mean, that was tough, but particularly our chair, Nancy Barton, 
Oh yeah, <laughs> straight line there. Yeah. <laughs> um, were your students uniformly young in these classes, or mostly? They didn't wear uniforms. I couldn't resist. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I think you're a natural. <laughs> you should do stand up. <laughs> oh, I need to do sit down. <laughs> uh, no, I. We were pretty much the same way, don't you think? I mm -hmm. mean, we're just and the same class in a way too. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know people have, will have would, uh, questions they'd love to ask about the work here, or life, or things in general. Yes. I would like to ask a question to the videographer. <laughs> um, I'm not an artist. I'm a videographer. <laughs> Can I be an artist, please? <laughs> Could just, I be an artist? He just please? wants to be an artist, not a videographer. Videographers do <laughs> weddings and bar mitzvahs. I don't do <laughs> weddings and bar mitzvahs. Don't put that down. <laughs> share with us a little bit about the difference in your subjective experience as an artist about when you are making a photograph or making a video. And before you answer, let me just give you a little context. I, I believe that a compelling photograph often is as much about what's not included as what is included. And more often than not, it's a portrait of the, of the photographer as much as it is of the subject. I think that video is organized, it's, it's a moving story, so it's organized under different principles, around different principles. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit about the difference of the journey that you take as an artist when you're making a photograph as opposed to making a video? Sometimes I feel compelled to speak in a Jewish accent. <laughs> so, <laughs> go ahead. Why not? Why not? I don't know. What's the difference? <laughs> I think it's the same. No, I mean, the way I would go about it would probably be the same. I, but, um, I was never a terribly good photographer, so um, it's one thing with video that I do, which is I walk away from the camera <laughs> when I'm when I'm recording. So that is not something I would ever do as a photographer. Um, well, I, so I asked the question because I am a good photographer, uh -huh. and I have resisted. I know many photographers who transition to video let's say it's a, there's a greater demand for it today. And yet I find it is such a different kind of experience in terms of uh, the creator and the journey that I take as a creator. I haven't been motivated. For me, a, a photograph is like a single shot cinema, and I find it very gratifying. Uh, I, made, I made videos early on when it was like 8mm and Super 8 first came out, and I wrote music and I scored it. I can see it three or four or five times and I don't want to see it anymore. Whereas with a great photograph, I can revisit it again and again and see different layers of information. So, uh, I agree, actually. Uh, I think photography is much further along than videography is right now. I mean, photography is what, 100 years older than, than video art, so. But I, I agree right now. I, I think it's. Um, it's great. I have great feeling looking at a photograph, um, but that's why I'm trying to play with the medium and make a still video <laughs> to to see if there's the same kind of interaction that's possible. Um, I think there's a big difference from the point of view of the audience. Um, to me, a photo is more like a painting than it is. It has a lot to do with what Peter was saying about that. Them's fighting words here. That, 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 let's let's get it on. You know, like a, when you're looking at a moving picture, whether it's a video or a film or listening to a concert, you are committed to that time span. Whereas when you look at a photo or a painting or a still object, you are the author of the time, being the viewer. And I think that's a really big difference. But my work is not in time. I make a point of that, that it's not in time. 
that it's. A, I, I I get that with your with your bit your work definitely. It's a similar feeling. You can go from one to another, or fast or slow or medium. But in general, when when there's a a, a theme in a video or a film, there's an expectation that you're not seeing it if you don't stay for the whole thing. No, no, no. I well, I don't see it that way. Do you think you can go into a movie and leave in 10 minutes and say you saw the movie? But I'm not making movies. No, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about the well, general I'm, idea. I want to talk about me. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, it's the same as looking at a painting. I mean, it's, it's in time. You're spending time looking at the painting. You're standing there. But I think the important thing is not about the aspect of time, but the uh, for you too, I think the important thing is standing there and something has to happen, whether it's a photograph or a video or a painting or a sculpture, something has to happen when you're standing there. If it's not happening, it's not happening. And to talk about those dimensions, I think are important. Standing in front of a painting of John, I'm really somewhere else for a while. I mean, I'm there, what I mean, by somewhere else. It's go beyond, beyond the paint. <laughs> And I feel I'm doing the same thing. John, a quick question about painting. Mm. I, don't, I don't discriminate painting, photography, whatever. John, I, your, your, your paintings seem to be organized and by, uh, you know, around the inspiration of the cosmos, uh, at least the, the works that you've seen here. And my question to you is do you find that with the intellect organizing the, you know, your, your initial idea when you're going to start painting, does the making of the painting often take you to completely unexpected places compared to where you started and where you thought you might be going? Or is there a lot more control in your process? Uh, for me, there's a scale between um, an idea such as, uh, I'm going to do this, which I call the outline fill-in. You know what you're doing. And on the other end, you find what you're doing. So for example, to me, the imagery that I'm uh, using uh, as an inspiration is similar to uh, a still life or a landscape for somebody like Cezanne or Monet. Uh, <laughs> it's a tool to help take me somewhere with the painting. I don't owe anything to it. That's the difference between me being involved with this imagery and a scientist being involved with it. They, they're trying to figure out what it's about. I'm trying to use it to uh, understand understand more things that I can do with painting. What do you mean you don't owe anything to it? I don't owe anything to the science. Oh, but you owe something to the painting. Exactly, right. And also not just my painting. If I see myself doing things that I see as cliches or what have you, it's like, uh, you're in a, you're in a, uh, this, what I said earlier about all art is contemporary art. All artists are contemporary artists in a sense. And for example, I, I use art history to give me permission to do whatever I want. And one of my self criticisms is that I overwork stuff and I, I'll have a painting that's been in a museum show and three years later I'll work on it some more. Yeah. And then uh, I think of Bonard. Bonard did the same kind of thing. You know, he would sneak into houses that people had paintings of his. He'd be get invited to dinner, and they'd find him over there going like this. And so I think if he can do it, then I can. It's okay. I mean, <laughs> but uh, and that's part of what modernism uh, is uh, is 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 about the idea that ideas themselves, are, there's a body politic of ideas that you're responsible to, to a certain extent. And younger artists get mad at you if you say, oh, this is coming right out of, you know, Gorky or something. And they, who's Gorky? And they get mad, you know. <laughs> but to me, that's your job, knowing who Gorky is, because uh, in the same way a composer would know who other composers were. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so there's the art of the art, and then there's the idea that you use to help make your art. And for me, that's the way that works. I think that's the age of our students, where they take that attitude. You get 10 years older, and you're thinking about Gorky and whoever. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. You're trying to think how you fit into this world. And take more responsibility but, for it. Yeah. 
I mean, they're kindergarten students we're teaching, basically. <laughs> 23 year old kindergarten students. I want to do it like I want. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Joel? A simple question for John. Um, I never worried about whether your paintings were paintings or sculpture. I, I thought they were always both, they were just Torianos. <laughs> Thank you for that. I like that. <laughs> Being a sculptor, I have a, a sort of a simple question. I noticed that uh, in many of the big paintings, there were four panels. Um, is that a practical consideration? Do you paint the panels separately? Do you paint them together? Uh, why four panels? Well, uh, it's practical, and also maybe I'm uh, emphasizing something that isn't there, but. Uh, it's practical because it's plywood, and I need the plywood in order to uh, do the variety of things that I do, uh, and that comes in certain sizes. The other thing is that uh, I've always felt that the, the image of the grid was the, was the, the, the unique, not unique, but the, one of the primary symbols of Western thought, right? It's the objectification of organic reality, you know, like, a grid is uh, what you have often in a camera, but also in a bomb site. You know, it's not a judgment. It's just a tool for measuring. On the question of the difference between painting and sculpture, I've always felt that paintings are sculptures. They're just thin. And, and, and you, 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 the more you know about painting, the more you can see the layers of the painting as a kind of uh, series of scrims on a stage, you know, compressed. And so you learn to look into that stage or look into this stage to deal with it. And by the same token, you start to see more in other painters' uh, ability to, to uh, articulate a variety of spaces within a very narrow space. It might be microcosmic, but it's still a three-dimensional object. But I'm always thinking of the statement that by a painter that sculpture is what you back into when you're looking at a painting. <laughs> what, was that Barnett Newman or somebody? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you don't, I don't. <laughs> well, modernism would, would, would uh, well, Greenberg would be very essentialistic about these questions and mm -hmm. say that uh, sculpture should only do what sculpture can do, and painting should only do two-dimensional things. Paintings should be very two-dimensional. It shouldn't be about imagery because that's the purview of photography and so on and so forth. But I put all, I throw all, all of that out. It was, you know. but it was a tough job for us to throw that out. Yeah. I mean, it took a long time for us working hard to get rid of that. And then we were cursed with postmodernism for Oh, it's a constant I mean. battle. It's a constant <laughs> battle. Yes. The question over here? Yeah. Could you talk about what we're seeing on the screen? Um, the images that are up there? I, I have to see the exhibit on the Well, that's, oh, that well, is the exhibit. That's a very, uh, that's, that, uh, there's about three things in the exhibition yeah. where if you were familiar with imagery of outer space, you would recognize them. You know, and this one is called the Eagle Nebula. And it's on the top of a gaseous spire. And you've seen that produced more than you have the Eagle Nebula. But if you look at the gaseous spire, it's like way up there. There's this little thing, but it's like 50 million light years across, you know. How, how big is that? That one is, uh, that one is uh, nine feet square. Yeah. Peter, I know that you walk away from the video camera while it's rolling and getting food. But it looks to my eye, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that you do a lot of manipulation with the video. At home. At home. Yeah. Which has, it seems like you put a lot of time into that in different areas of the footage or treated in different ways. Which seems to be sort of a painterly process. I've I've been cursed that way, Stephen, yes. <laughs> so mesmerizing, though, and while you know, different areas have more focus than others, and some are more saturated than others. And, but that's very different from walking away from the camera, so you put a lot of time and your consciousness into the crowd. Well, I walk away from the camera when it's recording, because right. uh, it's boring. 
<laughs> but you do a lot of work in post. But I and and well, I don't call it post, but I call it oh. I call it work. But yes, um, I, I yes, I work on the images afterwards a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Ask what software you use. Can you? Ask what software you use. I, I love to give the answer, you can ask. <laughs> but, what software do you use? But, <laughs> uh, I use Final Cut Pro for its, since its inception. I hear there are better programs out there, but I don't use them. I'm just loyal, loyal to Macintosh. <laughs> Okay. Not apples, I don't mean that. Um, <clears throat> this has been great. Oh, are we done? I think you should take this act on the road, basically. <laughs> Bob, Bob, you. Okay. We've just started. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Excellent. John, so. John sometimes did his comedy routine in school. Oh, no, really? By yeah. accident. By accident? No, that you'd send from the group of students and do your bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get very performative in my teaching. Mm -hmm. Did you get good reviews? Oh, now no. that students get to oh, really? review. Not from students. Uh, no. <laughs> the galleries are still open, I think. Yes. One of the reasons for I was attracted to Any doing of you who haven't been in? One of the reasons I was attracted to doing comedy was because. Uh, when uh, with uh, visual arts, uh, your success is so elusive. You can think you did a great show and get bad reviews and see bad shows that get great reviews. Yes. With sure. comedy, there's none of that. If you get the laughs, it's a good show. <laughs> if you don't get the laughs, it's a bad show. Nobody's gonna, yes. nobody's gonna say, you know, <clears throat> you busted up the room, but it sucked. Well, that's not going to happen. You have to remember that Citizen Kane got really bad reviews uh, when it came out, and no audience either. That's and, true. And when I went to school, it was considered the best film made, which I didn't believe. I, but um, what do you think of it now? I don't like it now. No. <laughs> it is a little dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> Rosebud. <laughs> I saw a Columbo the other night that had that theme in it, where the guy, the guy, Peter Falk. Yeah, I loved these. I worked with that fucker for a year. And he was a fucker. I heard he was. What, was he doing? what did you do for him? The most obnoxious thing Peter Falk did was when you know we're all running around the set trying to prepare it for the next shot, and he'd get bored, and he he had a glass eye, and he'd bang on it with his spoon. <laughs> and his, this was the worst sound you can possibly imagine. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're getting down and dirty now, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Amazing. Well, you, we're done, right? We can be down and dirty. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you do. Thanks, guys. Thank you, thank you.